Okay, let's open up in a word of prayer and we will we'll get started today. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. And Lord, I am just so blessed and so thankful. It is so wonderful seeing some people, Lord, I haven't seen in a little while. They are such a part of this group. They're such a part of my life, Lord. I don't want to miss time with a single one. I pray that you will bless our time today, Lord. I pray that you will take us back into your word and help us to be reminded of some of the things we talked about last time. But in addition to that, how what we are looking at in regards to idolatry in the land of Canaan, what that means for us regarding the end days as well. And of course, what that means regarding spiritual warfare. Lord, it's evident that the majority of people are not even paying attention to this. It's very, very clear. So Lord, keep our eyes open, draw us closer to yourself, keep us grounded in the truth. And Lord, I pray, that you will bear much fruit in us and through us for the glory of the Father and the Son. And Lord, we pray this to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, please turn back in your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 34. And we're going to revisit just six verses that we ended our time with on Thursday. And um, I wanna use that as a springboard into understanding the same truths that underlie these verses that the true church is struggling with today. And that the physical church is way out in left field somewhere with this. And the danger that that causes. So let's take a look at these verses together. Verses 11 to 16 of Exodus chapter 34. And here's what God's word says. Observe thou that which I command the this day behold i drive out before thee the amorite and the canaanite and the hittite and the perizzite and the hivite and the jebusite take heed to thyself lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land no matter where you go lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But you shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other god. For the Lord, whose name is jealous bear with me i just lost my spot there we go for the lord whose name is jealous is a jealous god lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they go a whoring after their gods and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and you eat of his sacrifice. And you take of their daughters unto your sons, and their daughters go whoring after their gods, and make your sons go whoring after their gods. You shall make thee no molten gods. 
God is preparing the nation of Israel to enter into the promise. And according to what the Lord's word says, There are six Gentile nations, six Gentile nations in the land of Canaan. The Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. They're all Gentiles. They're all worshiping a different God than the true God of the nation of Israel. And God warns them on several different fronts about this. He said, if you make any kind of covenant with them in this land, the promised land, It's going to be a snare for you. And the Lord will hold them accountable. We know based on our study of Exodus 32. That the law said. The Lord himself said as well. That whoever practices idolatry and serves false gods shall be killed in his sight. That is a message to the Jews. That's how serious God is about idolatry and serving false gods. He hates it. Not only is he a jealous God, but he is the only creator God. The only creator God. It makes a difference what we believe. It makes a difference who we believe. It makes a difference how we believe. Now, the danger for the Jews, not just in the land of Canaan, but everywhere they went, as David and the other kings conquered other lands, their biggest obstacle was all those other nations were Gentile nations. And every single one of them practiced idolatry. Every single one of them worshipped a different God. These gods could not speak. These gods could not protect. protect. These gods could not save them. These gods could not guide and direct their lives. These gods were worthless gods. Just like the golden calf that Aaron made. Worthless. But here's the problem. Many still bow down to these worthless gods. Many worship these worthless gods. They offer up sacrifices to these gods. They burn sacrifices on their altars. They bow down before it.
in the case of what Aaron had done in Exodus 32, he even called for a holy day to the Lord. Now, what a slap in the face that is. You call a holy day unto the Lord, and yet the God that you bow down and worship is not the true God. You're bowing down and worshiping a golden calf. Do you think that there is the wrath and the judgment of God that is just waiting to be poured out on this world? Or do you think that God is just going to turn his head and overlook it as if it's no big deal? Well, let me remind you one thing for sure. In the days of Noah, because they refused to not worship the true God and obey the true God, he wiped out every single one of them, men, wom man, woman, and child, except for eight people. Eight. In the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, he wiped, wiped out the whole population of two major cities because of their sexual practices. Four should have been saved, but one of the four looked back as if to long for those cities. Only three survived that. I There isn't a day that goes by that I don't hear someone telling me that God is a God of love. And I do not deny at all that that's one of his attributes. But that is not his most important attribute. His most important attribute is his holiness. If he was a God that was all love with no holiness and no righteousness, well, maybe he'd spare the whole world. But he is holy and he is righteous. And for that reason alone, the whole world is not going to be spared. The people in the world at the time of Noah came to learn that. The people that were alive in the days of Abraham certainly knew that. And yet, there is a judgment that is coming that will make those two judgments look like nothing. Because this one is going to destroy the whole world. And that's the one that is yet to come. It'll be like nothing that the world has seen up to this point. And you're already starting to see some of it take shape with strange weather patterns, drought, fire, earthquakes, you name it. And that's still only the beginning. The creator God, who made man in his own image, and who gave them a place to dwell, that until 
the sin of Adam and Eve was sinless. And look at where we have come. We have sunk so low that we cannot even acknowledge the true God, let alone obey him. And this world is being turned into hell on earth because of the sin of man. that has impacted and affected every realm on this earth that it possibly could, and that includes the church. It is filthy in the sight of God. The only exception are those that belong to him. It's the only exception. God tells the nation of Israel, who are his chosen nation, his chosen people, the people that the Messiah was going to be born to. He told them. You've got six groups of Gentiles. And you better destroy every idol and every altar. Or you're going to be led astray. And you are going to be bowing down to those same gods. Well, was God right or wasn't he? Speaking for us today in 2024, is God right or isn't he? We are bowing down to anything and anyone that man calls a God. And we're listening to them more than they are to the true God, even though we're holding his word. Do these people actually think for a minute that God is not going to follow through on his promises? Someone would have to be dreaming to think that. Who would want corruption in heaven anyhow? God's not going to budge an inch. And that's why his warnings are so severe. The problem is, especially in our day, no one's listening to it. The majority of people, and you've heard me say this many times, and it's because it's true, the majority of people in the physical church today are not saved. They are not spirit-filled. They have never been born again. They do not know the true God. They don't even have a hunger for the true God, nor his word. And we will put aside the word of God and listen to sinful man instead. Where do people think that is going to get them? I think the word is very clear where that's going to get them. But somehow, they think that there's going to be some big exceptions to that. 
That's a lie from the enemy. God has never broken a promise. And what God has said was going to happen, happened. And now what he's saying is going to happen is going to be something that is unlike this world has ever seen. And yet, most of the church is sound asleep. And man, and even churches are taking the very word of God and casting it aside and says, and says, hey, I don't have time to read all that. Just distill it down for me, will you? Give me the top two or three points. And there's pastors that are willing to compromise that. God will hold them to account for not dealing properly with his word and his truth. And for those that have come to believe a lie because of that, he will hold them accountable for their blood as well. Ezekiel talks about that to a great extent. God says, I don't care who's in that land. I don't care what God they believe. I know it's not me. And I am the one true God. So destroy their altars, break down their images, cut down their groves. And you, my chosen people, will have no other God before you. For I am the Lord, and I am a jealous God. And then he warns them one more time, and he says, if you end up making a covenant with the people in the land, here's what's going to happen. You're going to pursue their gods and their idols. And you're even going to partake in sacrifices to those false gods and idols. And then on top of it, you will even partake in eating of the food which was sacrificed to that false god and false idol, which was forbidden for the Jews. They would have nothing to do with any other god or practice. If the reality is, by the time they were ready to come into the land, which was after that initial generation that came out of Egypt, died off in the wilderness, the generation that came from them is actually the one who inherited the promised land. Everything that the Lord told them not to do, they did. In the final account where they are getting ready to go into the promised land, the Lord tells them, you get rid and destroy every man woman, child, and cattle. Because all of them have bowed down to false gods.
And he warned them to say that if you don't, this is going to come back and bite you. Because you and your own people in the nation of Israel are going to do the exact same thing. You're going to bow down to their gods. You're going to worship their gods. You're going to burn offerings on the altar. And then you're going to eat of that food, that sacrifice to an idol. And sure enough, that is exactly what happened. To top it all off, when they were told to kill the women, the men of the nation of Israel decided what a waste that would be. Let's spare the women. And we'll take them for ourselves. It was through those women that they were seduced into believing in these false idols and false gods. So much so that they were in fact bowing down to them, worshiping them on the altar, offering up sacrifices to them and eating the sacrifices. The very thing God warned them against, they did. God called that whoring or prostituting. He even warned them for the sake of their sons. He tells them, don't think that you can take the daughters of these Gentile nations and bring them to your sons, because they're going to seduce your sons into believing their gods. And you will be just as corrupt as they are. That is why the Lord said that the penalty for idolatry and rejecting the true God for a false one was death. You can't get any lower than that. Israel was trying to keep peace with the Gentile nations, but in the process of doing so, they turned their back on the true God. They have paid for that mistake more than any other nation in the world. And they still continue down that path. They reject the true God and they even rejected their Messiah. Which is why right now their eyes are blinded and they are deafened. Until, Paul says, the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Israel is not going to receive their Messiah until the period known as the Great Tribulation, the second three and a half years of the Tribulation, the worst of the worst time. The Antichrist will be reigning. And those that refuse to bow will be slaughtered. All of that stems from idolatry. This is the second book of the Bible. 
And Israel already had huge problems with this way back then. But nothing has changed. Nothing has improved. For right now, their eyes are still blinded. They have no temple. They serve no God. And they reject Jesus. Apart from divine intervention, they'd never be saved. But even in the future, for those that are saved, there's still this 2,000 year period of time that all those Jews died without a savior. And we know they couldn't have kept the law for no man can keep the law. And they haven't had a temple since 70 AD. How can they be saved? This has implications not only for Israel, but for us too. Let's fast forward to the year 2024. What do you see happening around you today? Step back and just observe. What do you see going on? Well, for one thing, there is no right or wrong anymore. Perhaps that's why they don't want anything to do with God's word. Because God clearly speaks about something that is right and something that is wrong. Maybe that's part of the problem. But there's something, something even more frightening than that. Regardless of what the world religion is, we've got people that are willing to compromise. They take it upon themselves. This is not a work of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. In other words, here's what's happening in our day. Yes, the Jews had a real problem with the Gentile nations, but this one is getting to be even worse. Because in our day, everything is global. So here's what happens. Before they even acknowledge the true God and bow down before the true God, They want to know what their options are. Now, right off the bat, that's something very, very different than on a few millennia ago. It used to be that when the true God spoke or spoke through his prophets, there was no questioning anything. There were still many that disobeyed, 
but at least they were not questioning the authentic, the authentic, uh, tripping on my own words here, the authenticity of what the true God said. In other words, if he sent, said no idolatry, he meant no idolatry. And they knew exactly what he meant. They still disobeyed, but they knew. Today, people don't know. And they're okay without knowing because for them, ignorance is bliss. Very dangerous place to be. So those that know nothing about the true God, who have never read about him, studied about him, they go to a church that barely touches on superficial topics, they don't come to know anything that's true. Everything can be negotiated. Everything can be compromised. There is no black and white anymore. None. So now you've got these people ignorant of the truth, and before them, is a whole buffet of different things they can pick from. In other words, take your pick of what you want to believe and disregard the rest. Take your pick of the kind of God you want. Disregard the rest. Take your pick of the kind of Messiah you want and disregard the rest. So in our day, other than true Christianity, who are the elect of God alone. Everything else can be compromised. And it is being compromised. This is why today, and you'll find, you will find that people that disagree on some things only disagree for fear that if it wasn't, if it was the truth, they personally would be in big trouble. For example, the topic of hell. Some say, Hell's not a real place. Some say the judgment is not eternal. Some say, like the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church, the current Pope, that hell is only a state of being. Unlike the scriptures, including the book of Revelation, there's no fire. There's no brimstone. There's no eternal flames. There's no torment day and night for all eternity. They disregard all of that. They refuse to believe it. Why? 
Because if they were to believe that any of that is true, and if they're wrong in their assessment of what hell is, and they refused to take the word of God and believe what the word of God says, they'd be in a bad place, wouldn't they? So they can say out of ignorance, since I really didn't know, I just did the best that I could in understanding what it is, since I really can't understand that kind of concept, nor do I believe in eternal judgment. So they reduce hell, like the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church, down to a state of being. Well, isn't a state of being a far cry from eternal flame and torment? Actual fire? This is the leader of 1.2 billion followers. And that's what he says about it. Now, if that's what it was, would God lie in the scriptures? Would God intentionally tell us a lie? No, he wouldn't. God is truth. This is man. And behind it is the enemy, seducing them with lies and signs and lying wonders. Getting them just like he did to completely discredit the word of God so that the meaning of what we think it is is completely different from what it says. Well, how many people would fear hell if it's only a state of being? You see the danger in that? That's happening right now. I know that some of you who are here pretty regularly, you've heard us talk before about the fact that the Pope of Rome and some evangel evangelists like Rick Warren and others Are very supportive of the religion of Islam. So much so that both the Church of Rome and these evangelists, including Rick Warren, have come up with a name for this religion. And it is intended to promote. Those who believe in Islam as our brothers and sisters in Christ. The name of the religion is Chrislam. Christianity and Islam together. But is that even possible? Well, it all depends. It all depends on how much you want to compromise the truth. Let's start by me giving you some basic facts. The religion of Islam 
worships a different God. They worship Allah. And we believe in and worship the Judeo-Christian God, the creator of all. Though they acknowledge the name of Jesus, they don't look at Jesus as the Son of God. They don't believe in him as the Son of God. They also don't believe in him as the Savior because they don't think they need a Savior. They believe he is a prophet for Muhammad, the Son of God that we know, they think, is just a prophet for Muhammad. They worship and serve a different God. They have no Messiah. And Jesus is only a prophet. They also deny the crucifixion. They deny the atonement. They deny the resurrection. So just with that much, where are all the similarities between the Islamic God or religion and biblical Christianity? Where are all these similarities? How dare the religious leaders of our day, of our day, both of them, stand up and declare that Muslims, without professing faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, as the Son of God and as the Messiah, without declaring any of that, that they are still our brothers and sisters in Christ. Does something sound really off with that? I hope so. Because you've got the leader of one of the biggest world religions that's supportive of it. so much so that they're quick to call them brothers and sisters in Christ. But how can you be if you're not even worshiping the true Christ? They've never been born again. They've never received the gospel. How can they be? Unless you are compromising everything that you know and believe regarding what the scriptures say in order to make that a reality. And if that's what's happening, which clearly is what is happening, then the wrath and the judgment of God is going to be poured out very soon. Jews in the days of their going to the promised land were killed for worshiping a false idol. 
Now, what would the Lord say about a false religion, a compromised religion, a religion that oversees 1.2 billion people? If you talk of the believers of both Islam and Catholicism, there are 1.3 million, I'm sorry, 1.3 billion followers of Islam, 1.2 billion followers of Catholicism. That is 2.5 billion people, which is more than 25% of the world population today believe in one of those two. 25 plus percent. And yet we've got some of the most recognized names promoting such a lie. Ladies and gentlemen, we know that we cannot be saved by any religion, right? Because a religion is based on the works of man. And no man or no woman is ever going to be saved by their works. It's just not going to happen. It would make the cross completely unnecessary. We also know that salvation is not found through the keeping of the law. For the Lord himself says, there is no one, no one who is righteous, not one who is righteous, except for Christ, when he became man on this earth. Other than him, there is no one who is righteous. So how can we be saved by the keeping of the law when we don't keep the law? There's not one of us that ever has. And if they did, they would have attained their own righteousness. But that in and of itself denies the word of God in Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Because the Lord says there is not one who is righteous. No, not one. So we can't be saved by our works. Can't be saved by our good deeds. We can't be saved by our religion. And we cannot be saved by the law. How else can we be saved? If any other religion rejects all that, then according to God and his word, they are unredeemed. And if they're unredeemed, ladies and gentlemen, how and why would we even attempt to establish a belief system or a religion or a unity with these people when that is just like taking idolaters and putting them together with God's people? when God would have killed those same idolaters. How can we do that? Don't think it's, it stops with Islam. 
in our day, you've got the same blending of religions going on right now with Hinduism and Christianity, Buddhism and Christianity. You can go right down the list. There's this unification of, go of man going on that is uniting everything they believe. And where they cannot unite, someone compromises. And to this date, the one that's doing all the compromising is the Christian faith of all people. They're the ones compromising. They're compromising to serve a foreign God, a different God, an idol. Their Messiah is reduced to a prophet, which means the atonement on the cross of Calvary means nothing. In fact, if the Lord hadn't already received it, you and I would have no means by which we could be saved. Because the world will go only so far as to acknowledge him as a prophet or something similar. It's idolatry. To reject all of the true doctrines of Christianity that have been timeless, all for the sake of compromise, is idolatry. We are not worshiping the same God. We are not worshiping the same Messiah. All we're trying to do is to unite the world. And we are going to have a charismatic leader that's going to be at the head of that one day that the world is going to accept with both arms outstretched and they're going to bow down to him and they're going to worship him as God. Because he's going to understand us. Well, sure he should. Because he sinned. And the one that gives him his power is the enemy himself. We have no idea how treacherous the ground that we are walking on really is. And men and women are still quick to compromise. We're still quick to find middle ground. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're looking for middle ground, then you're hanging on to the wrong thing. It'll never save you. There is no middle ground. The cross proves it. How, after everything that Jesus did on our behalf, are we willing to allow someone to say that he is a prophet at best? Yet look around. That's exactly what's happening. And even in their doing that, they still refuse to acknowledge him for who he is. 
He's not the Messiah to them. He's not the Son of God to them. He's not eternal to them. He's not the Word incarnate, which is why they think they have all the permission in the world to compromise whatever they feel like, all just because they don't agree with it. If the Lord came back today, it would be a bloodbath. And I can guarantee you that out of the whole world, you would be looking at a very small percentage of men and women who will actually be saved. That's why Jesus said, that the wide road will lead to destruction. Because you're going to welcome anything and everything. But the narrow road is the road to heaven. Unfortunately, Jesus himself said, few will ever find it. They won't entertain it. They want to compromise, compromise, compromise. Because that's not the way they want to live their life. It's so restrictive. In essence, that is exactly what Adam and Eve said. Before they took the bait to the enemy. You realize that? These are the days that we are standing in right now. Right now. The world. Our fo is following people who are not the sons and daughters of the living God, but who are instead willing to allow them to compromise whatever they want. After all, they themselves are compromising. Don't think for a second. that those people will be saved. Especially with all the blood on their hands. Don't think for a minute. Remember what all this is working towards. All of this is working towards the apostate church. The whore of Babylon. Babylon the Great. Whatever name you want to go by, it is going to be a worldwide global religion. That through compromise, anyone and everyone will receive. To the delight of Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet. The unholy trinity. And while normally all of those would have been put to death, God is holding off his judgment for the end.
everything that's compromised will lead people to hell. We don't tell the Creator God the way it should be. He tells us. We yield and obey. And if we don't, we don't belong to Him. Compromise whatever you want. You don't belong to him and neither does anybody else that is believing those lies and when babylon the great that pagan world religious system that comes into power which is already in the works Every single one of them will be deceived. And it'll be too late for them to be saved. Don't look at compromise as a blessing. Look at compromise as a curse. If what you are compromising is the true God, the true Messiah, the true spirit and his word, don't touch it, reject it. The Lord hasn't called on us to slaughter these people. Vengeance is his, he says. We leave that for him. We don't slaughter anyone. But we don't compromise either. Because you and I are accountable for that. And God help us if we mislead any of the children of God. Now, with that said, can you see a battle brewing? That battle is picking up momentum every single day. And the majority of people that think they're saved are sound asleep as they're seduced every day into compromise. And compromise they do. They will never be saved. If it sounds like the Lord is only talking about a relatively small amount of people, it's because he is. The way of God, the followers of the Lord have never been the majority. Never, never, ever been the majority. We are salt and light in this world for a short season. And then upon the authority of the word of God, The enemy's kingdom comes into power. The final Gentile kingdom that is getting so close, you can almost reach out and touch it. One more key point. Perhaps this goes a long way in understanding the pope's words to all 
of the world's religions, which he has gathered and has regular meetings with their leaders so that we could have this one world horde. His exact words were, don't worry about the name of your God. The Pope says, because we all worship the same God. He just goes by different names. You want to Google it? Go right ahead. You'll not only find the quote associated with him, you may even find a audio recording or a video recording of him saying those exact words. He's telling the entire world, don't worry about the name of your God because all gods are the same. We worship the same God. Now, let me ask you this. In your study of the word of God, is there anything in there, Old Testament or New Testament, that says such a thing? Of course, the answer would be no. Now, what do you say when the second largest world religion or third largest, whatever it is, is standing up and saying that in front of the whole world? And he is supposed to be Christian. I would say. He is an antichrist. Because he is promoting the enemy, not Jesus Christ. That whore of Babylon, that final religious order whatever it's going to be called i can tell you this much whatever it's called it doesn't even matter because i'll guarantee you this the pope is going to be a part of it the roman catholic church is going to be a part of it guaranteed along with every other world religion so that no matter where you go in this world you can worship the same god won't be a God at all. It'll be the enemy. The world will be deceived into thinking they're worshiping God, but they're worshiping the enemy. This is happening now. Do you think there's going to be improvement on that over the next 10 to 20 years? I think by then it's going to be full blown. And that the number of true believers, as the church continues to grow in apostasy, the number or percentage of saved is going to drop substantially. 
that combined with the fact that the word of God is going to be hard to find, that combined with the fact you're going to have lies and uh, deception all over the place, the majority will be blinded. And it will take, it'll bring rather great pleasure to the Lord to destroy this heart. Who fornicated spiritually with the kings and the queens of this world. If there's any question as to what we're doing or why, I will be more than happy to clarify it for you further. All I can tell you is we have got many true brothers and sisters out there that are walking alone, surrounded with this garbage, and they can't even find someone to pray for them. in our day it comes out of our own pastor's mouths gee i'd like to pray for you but i don't have the time what is more important than that we've got brothers and sisters in christ that need encouragement that need prayer that need love, that need care, that need to be part of a fellowship, a true fellowship, and they can't get it in their own building because the majority of the physic physical church are unredeemed false believers. How is that going to happen? This is nothing to play with because it's almost right in our face. But I pray you will take this seriously enough to reflect on it and open your eyes and take a look at what's going on around you right where you live. And then come back to Exodus 34 and take another look at 11 to 17. And you will see that every single thing that I just shared with you starts with idolatry and compromise. The Lord is very clear what he wants especially for the brethren. His words in 1 John are, that as you have, as Jesus has laid down his life for you, and you have received that from him, so you should lay your lives down for the sake of the brethren. Who are the brethren? It's not mankind. It's not a brother or sister you have in your household, because even within a household, there's no guarantee everyone's going to be saved. The brethren are your brothers and sisters in Christ. the elect of God. That's the brethren. You lay your life down for them. To pray for them, to encourage them. To edify them. They can't even study unless they do it on their own.
they will never be ready for what's coming if we continue to leave them out there alone. And I'm sure that the majority of, of you know such people. All of this starts with idolatry and a rejection of the true God and his word. Only in our day, which is unprecedented, this is going to lead to the end. There is no doubt about it. Because that's exactly what John wrote in Revelation that is going to lead to the end. The harlot will be destroyed. And the first three that are going to go to hell, the first three, will be the false prophet first, followed by the Antichrist, followed by Satan himself. Those will be the first three in the lake of fire. Now, if the lake of fire, according to many, is just a little slap in the wrist, I think that Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet would all have a wonderful laugh over that. That alone tells me that the lake of fire is exactly what the Lord says it's going to be. It is not going to be a state of being what the heck does Satan care about a state of being? What kind of judgment is that? I pray for each one of you that as you look around, that something that we said here today will go off like an alarm in your mind as you're looking at whatever you're looking at so that you in your own mind can take this message and what you're witnessing and seeing all around you and bring it all together. Because that's what's coming. Forget the wars. Forget the famines. Yeah, that's all a part of stuff we're going to deal with, but we already deal with that stuff. We're talking the end of the age. The end of the church age is coming. And this prostitute is going to reign. That should be cause for concern for you and I. None of us know when the Lord is returning. But there's a possibility that it may be a little while. And if it is, that means it may be my time to go or yours before that happens. The last thing I think we would want is to have our eyes open and understanding what's going on. And then just walk away from it like nothing's happening. 
I think the Lord may have something to say to us. If that's how we handle it, don't you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word and truth. Lord, everything starts with idolatry. Everything starts with rejecting you as the true God. And rejecting your word as the truth by which we are to live by. Lord, the end days are racing towards us. And it's very clear according to your word what is going to happen. Even Christian religions are going to worship false gods. They're going to worship idols. They're going to offer up sacrifices to those idols. And they will be just as pagan as Babylon. where all this paganism began. I pray, Lord, you will keep us firm to the end. I pray that the word compromise will be taken out of our vocabulary. Because anything regarding you, Lord, compromise is not a good thing. And the world is going to be deceived because of it. Lord, if it is your desire. And there are brothers and sisters that you want us to minister to. And to grow with and to fellowship with or whatever your plans are. Bring them to us, Lord. Bring them to us. Because where they are planted, it may be very difficult, if not impossible, for them to receive it in their own church. I've been there as well. May your will be done, Lord, for your glory. And may may the brothers and sisters who have not come to saving faith yet, are still out there. I pray you will lead them to eternal life. That the church age will come to an end. And your judgment will be poured out. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this honor and privilege to come together. May your will be done in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you, everyone. I thank you so, so much for being here today. And I pray I truly pray that the Lord will speak very, very clearly to you in the days 